screen. But yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about intelligent architectures for intelligent systems. Hopefully, this will cover uh, some of the spirit of this conference. Uh, it'll, it'll certainly touch on all aspects, I think, but some aspects more than others, perhaps. Uh, and I, uh, I like giving this talk because today we're trying to build intelligent systems a lot more than before. And we claim that they're intelligent. But I will argue that at the core, they're quite not intelligent. And we really need to change that mentality in the design of our computing systems so that if you really want to truly really want to make these systems intelligent, uh, the design of the systems uh, themselves should be intelligent uh, as well. OK. Uh, so I think everybody agrees that the problem we're facing today is computing is bottlenecked by data. And important work workloads are all data intensive. Uh, they require rapid and efficient processing of large amounts of data. And we're doing increasingly sophisticated things on data, trying to make a lot more sense, make predictions out of that data. And on top of this, data is increasing. We can generate much more data than we can process today in many, many domains. And this has clearly led to uh, the machine learning AI revolution that we're experiencing today. The fact that data is increasing, uh, on top of which we have high performance computing systems like GPUs that are able to crunch through that data relatively fast uh, in, uh, in speeds that we have never encountered before. And that has clearly enabled that revolution. But I think I, I would argue that we're still lacking a lot. We still need to do a lot more so that we can actually make sense of this data. And all important workloads, AI, ML, genomics, I'm going to talk about genomics a little bit, uh, are intensive. And if you look at more traditional workloads that look like this, they're all data intensive and they're facing significant performance energy bottlenecks because of data. And if you look at the mobile end, these workloads are also facing significant performance energy bottlenecks uh, uh, because of data as well. So let's talk about genomics also. I think it's an, it's an area that I actually quite like. Uh, and uh, we, we can today uh, sequence genomes much faster and at much higher bandwidth and at much lower cost than we used to be able to. So if you look at this figure over here, this figure shows the cost of genome, se genome sequencing per megabase, let's say. Uh, and it's reducing much faster than the cost of a transistor is reducing, as predicted by Moore's law. You can see that this enables us to sequence a lot more genomes. And clearly, this can enable many, many interesting things, scientific discoveries, uh, medical advancements, uh, and also understanding of uh, diseases and their spread, for example, variants, et cetera, and interactions between drugs and diseases, et cetera. So there are many, many things that can be enabled today. But today, we're very much bottlenecked by data. Sequencing machines are quite good, quite strong. But our computational analysis engines are not good enough. They're not keeping up, basically. They're not able to do this efficiently and at high performance. As a result, again, data becomes a huge energy and performance bottleneck over here. And this is especially important in embedded systems that look like this. We have these genome sequencing technologies, which fits in your hand, as you can see. They can actually do quite a good job in sequencing genomes. You can buy this for $1,000 to $3,000, for example. And you can sequence any genome you want. This is being used. Actually, these were some of the first devices that were shipped to China after uh, the COVID pandemic started. People tried to understand what's going on uh, with the COVID pandemic. And uh, these devices have been extremely instrumental for that and many other uh, pandemics as well. Uh, but unfortunately, this device is quite dumb, basically. It can, it can, it can sequence genomes, but it cannot process genomes. You cannot make any sense out of this. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we actually gave this sort of device to a doctor or a person or any private person, if you will, and they take this device and they sequence their genomes and they figure out whatever they want to in terms of their uh, interactions with drugs, in terms of their vulnerabilities to diseases, in terms of, I don't know, what, what kind of protection mechanism they should use for different sorts of uh, diseases, etc., uh, in a private manner. But we don't have that today. And our goal is to enable something like this. But again, uh, fundamental principles uh, that we, with which we design computing devices are not keeping up, in my opinion, in terms of designing this sort of intelligent devices. And I, I can talk a lot more about genome analysis, but we write papers about it too. This is a more recent survey paper we wrote at IEEE Micro that discusses the overview of the field, how we can extract genome analysis, et cetera. And we also have uh, some other works that try to design specialized accelerators for approximate string matching, for example, in this example. I'm not going to go into details. I'm going to flash a lot of papers and slides at you, if you will. Feel free to uh, ask any questions, and I'm happy to discuss more. But I think going into the future, this is going to become increasingly interesting. So these devices also exist. Again, they have very limited processing capability. So the device is very good at generating data, but it has zero intelligence in terms of processing and understanding what it generates. 
And as a result, what data moves a lot in the system. Basically, you can generate a lot of data. You have to send it to a data center, or if you're lucky, to a laptop. If you can do that analysis on a laptop, of course, it may take weeks and weeks on a laptop. But if you send it to a data center, you're moving data all around the system, exercising all the communication infrastructure that we have, wasting a lot of energy. And also, uh, you process it with many, many uh, devices in a data center. So your latencies are, uh, and your latencies on energy is completely exacerbated. So hopefully we can get to a point where these devices are actually a, a lot more intelligent and we can give it to people and people can do the analysis locally without moving data all around. Okay, if you're interested in more, I think Chita mentioned there are a lot of lectures we put on YouTube that talk about this sort of issues. Uh, and by the way, I should say that we were working on this much before the pandemic started. I think pandemic is a great example of why genome analysis is important, but there, there are many, many other examples. Okay, so I think I've, I've given you one example, and I think one application that's quite limited by uh, the way we handle data today. Today, the way we handle data, it all rounds modern machines. It all rounds our storage, memory capability, communication capability, and computation capability. And I think these are the three pillars of this conference, if you will. If you consider architecture just computation, which is beyond computation, clearly, but these are three pillars. And data greatly impacts robustness, energy, performance, and cost also. We're going to talk about that as well. If you look at a computing system, it consists fundamentally of three key components, computation, communication, storage, and memory. And over decades and decades, we heavily optimize the computing unit. If you look at all of the other parts of the system, they're not optimized as much. We kind of ignore them, let's say. In, in other words, they're not intelligent. Data has to go to the computing unit, which consists today of CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, accelerators, etc., uh, before it can get processed. Everything else that actually has huge amounts of data stored and moving, they have no intelligence. They cannot operate on the data. And if you look at a single node uh, in, a, in a micro system, let's say, it looks like this, basically. This is actually a picture that I drew uh, when, I, when, I first, uh, when I wrote one of my earliest NSF proposals in about 2008 or so. And this picture still remains the same. What this picture shows is, I think, uh, you have computing units, accelerators, cores, etc. Uh, uh, that uh, can, can do computation on data, but everything else in the system, caches, interconnects, other caches, other interconnects, memory controls, other interconnects, other caches or memory, other interconnects, and uh, storage. Uh, basically, everything else in the system other than the cores and accelerators is uh, moving and storing data. So if you do the calculation, more than 95% of a single node's area, real estate, is dedicated to components that move and store data. Yet, system is still bottlenecked by data and memory. So I think this picture should tell us that we're probably doing something wrong in our systems. We're putting a lot of effort to do data movement and storage, yet we're waiting for data to come back to the processors. Maybe we should really rethink how we're designing computing systems. Okay, so that was one example in terms of area, let's say. Let's look at energy. On these workloads, uh, we did studies with Google a few years ago, and basically we looked at uh, the energy consumption of data movement on the workloads that I showed you earlier, that everybody uses essentially web browsers, video, uh, machine learning inference, the uh, TensorFlow framework. We basically found out that more than 60% of the entire system energy is spent on data movement. This is just data movement across memory hierarchy. Storage is not counted over here, for example. So I think uh, going forward, my axiom in this talk will be that if you really want to design truly intelligent architecture, you should handle data well. And I'm not going to question this assumption going forward. So of course, this brings the question of how do we handle data well? And I think this has three components, which I will hopefully get to in this talk. One is we, we should ensure that data does not overwhelm the components. We should design our systems in a fundamentally different way, in a fundamentally better way, let's say. We have intelligent algorithms that minimize data or that, or that basically do better with the data movement. We have intelligent architectures that do essentially the same thing. And more importantly, we have whole system designs all the way from algorithms to architectures to devices that essentially minimize the data overwhelming the components. Uh, on top of this, I think there are two other directions that I will probably not have much time to cover since I'm supposed to talk for 40, 50 minutes, I think. And feel free to stop me if you, if, if you think I'm going fast. Uh, but I think these are equally important. Uh, and we need to really understand that. I think today's systems, for example, are built in a way that there's a lot of data flowing through our systems. And the systems are making decisions. But these decisions are not really affected by the data. Meaning, uh, essentially, uh, for example, my cell phone, let's say five years old, uh, it has a memory controller in it. This memory controller has seen a lot of applications, has interacted with me, at least indirectly. Uh, I've done a lot of different things. A lot of applications flew through it, and uh, a lot of uh, different environmental conditions were experienced. But this memory controller is doing exactly the same thing it was designed to do by a human, let's say, 10 years ago. And it's, it basically makes human-driven decisions. It really didn't adapt 
It's very different from how we make decisions as humans, right? We, we, for example, interact with the environment and adapt our decisions based on learning. We learn. But the systems today don't learn. And I think we really need to change that. This system needs to be data-driven. On top of this, I think uh, this is also important. Uh, basically, da different data that flows through the system that we uh, operate on has different kinds of properties. It has different kinds of security properties, privacy properties, approximability properties, compressibility properties, lo even locality properties, something that we claim to understand very well. I would argue that we don't quite understand locality even very well today. But these uh, properties, even, even if we assume that we can understand them, today we cannot really communicate them to the underlying architecture. And as a result, the architecture has no idea about the different types of properties of different data. As a result, it cannot make very good decisions based on the data characteristics. Today, it makes component-aware decisions as opposed to data-aware decisions. Whereas if we actually communicate, for example, the security characteristics of different data, we can treat those data differently, uh, such that we can design much more secure parts of the system that's dedicated for uh, security-critical data and less secure parts of the system for less secure data or less security-critical data. And there are many examples over here. OK, so I think I've kind of covered this slide also. If you look at architectures today, they're not good at dealing with data. They're designed, as I showed you, to mainly store and move data as opposed to compute. Basically, this is because they're processor-centric as opposed to data-centric. And I'm going to talk a lot about this in this talk. We're going to deconstruct this processor-centric paradigm. Uh, as I also said, today's architectures are not learning from the data that's flowing through them. As a, as a result, they're designed to make simple decisions, ignoring lots of data, because they make human-driven decisions as opposed to data-driven decisions. So they cannot adapt uh, to, the, uh, to the system. And, and the conditions and the users. And uh, third, architectures today don't know uh, different properties of different application data. As a result, they're usually designed to treat all data as the same, especially general purpose architectures this way. Special purpose architectures are a bit better uh, through more, uh, more domain specific architectures, but still, uh, they're not good at differentiating different types of data, uh, in a, uh, different types of properties also. Uh, and as a result, architectures make component aware decisions. They optimize for the components. Uh, for example, they optimize for the, uh, whenever you're optimizing uh, your, your memory controller, let's say, you optimize for the row buffer, bank, uh, uh, you optimize for the memory bus bandwidth, etc. You optimize for the different power modes, as opposed to whether the data is critical, whether the data needs to be accessed with uh, low energy, whether the data needs to be private, etc. I don't know what's going on on that screen, sorry about that. Uh, there's some, I don't know if it's on my end. Okay. Yeah, I cannot fix it over here, but I'll continue, I think. OK, basically, uh, we need to change that so that we can make data aware decisions in all of the components that we have. OK, as I said, I'm going to focus especially on the data centric part. But I think going forward, if we want to design fundamentally better, fundamentally intelligent architectures, we really need to rethink how we handle data. And I think these three properties are really necessary. And these three properties interact with each other also. For example, if you want to be data driven, you also want to be data centric. And if you want to be data centric, you really need to take advantage of uh, the data centricity, let's say, processing capability inside the memory, inside the storage, inside the communication unit. You want to be data aware as well. But I think to be able to do this, we really need to revisit the entire stack. And uh, this requires us to revisit all the way from algorithms to devices. But I believe we can get there step by step uh, without making a revolution, let's say, overnight. OK, sorry about that. That's I hope it's not my fault in some way. <laughs> okay. Okay. So basically, uh, to achieve the highest energy efficiency and performance, I think we really need to take this expanded view of architecture, co-design across the hierarchy from algorithms to devices, and specialize as much as possible within the design goals. And I think I will also mention uh, several things over here. Give, it, give it a, a quick historical view. Uh, this is, uh, probably people know about this, there's plenty of room at the bottom. This is Richard Feynman said in 1959 at a talk he delivered, uh, and, uh, which later became famous, essentially. Basically, he said that uh, we can manipulate electrons, and basically this will enable many, many interesting things like nanotechnology, uh, like uh, surgical robots, etc. He gave a lot of interesting applications of uh, basically this nanoscale improvements. And I still believe that we have a lot of room at the bottom, even though some people claim that we don't have room at the bottom anymore. Uh, I think that it's still important to explore new technologies, for example, going into the future. How can we do better? Uh, how can we actually manipulate uh, one, one tenth of an atom, for example, electron? I think uh, in storage, we're getting to those uh, dimensions today, which is interesting. But there's also plenty of room at the top. Uh, clearly, there, these folks have written this paper uh, where they 
uh, actually pointed out very important things, saying that software and architecture will become more important as technology scaling becomes harder. Uh, where I don't agree with them is uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that they, they say uh, there's not much room left at the bottom. I disagree with that, I think. I think we have a lot of room at the bottom, we just need to discover it, basically. Where today, uh, our imagination may not be enough, or our scientific understanding may not be enough to discover what's at the bottom. Uh, so I think we really need to focus at the uh, bottom, at the top of the computing stack. But I think maybe even more importantly, uh, there's plenty of room at the bottom as, as well as the top, but I think there's much more so potential if we communicate well between and optimize across the top and the bottom. And that requires this cross-layer, cross-stack approach uh, that I mentioned. I'm going to give you examples from this, hopefully, in this talk. Okay, so let me jump into... Well, now this is also gone. Okay. Mm. <laughs> so we have fault tolerance to dual modular redundancy. Yeah. <laughs> At least one is working. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about a data centric architecture. So I think if you want to be data centric, I think there are at least four properties that we want to uh, maintain and enable. First, we should process where data resides, uh, meaning where it makes sense. Uh, this brings us to processing in and near memory structures or anywhere where the data resides or moves. Today, we have no ability to process data uh, where it resides or moves. Today, we have to go through the processor or the accelerator. And I think we need to change that. Uh, second, we need to enable low latency and low energy data access. I think we're not doing too well on this one. Our memories are still far away uh, from uh, the processor. Uh, and even if the processors go to the memories, I think we should, we should still have lower la latencies and energy. We need to have low cost data storage and processing. I think clearly there's a lot of effort in that direction. And on top of this, we need to have intelligent data management. We should have intelligent controls handling robustness, security, cost, etc. So I'm going to talk about, uh, especially the first one, uh, integrated with the intelligent data management, because we're having difficulties in the robustness security issues because of the technology scaling. OK, so let's jump into it. I, I called also processing data where it resides, uh, because uh, we want to be able to process data wherever it resides, uh, as opposed to being restricted to the processor or the accelerators. And clearly, you will say that this is an old idea, right? And I agree. These are some old papers that were written in 1960s, late 1960s, as you can see. People have proposed the idea of processing in memory. This is perhaps a more famous paper by Harold Stone in 1970, based on the research he did while he was at Stanford. Uh, and people have examined this idea many, many times over decades, and it never panned out really well. I would argue that today is probably the right time, and we should think about it a bit differently going into the future. So why is today the right time? I think there are two, uh, uh, two, two things that are uh, confluenced together. Basically, we have a huge push from technology, that's asking us to do something intelligent in our main memories. Uh, and I'm going to give you some evidence from the field. And we have a huge pull from applications and systems that's asking us to do something intelligent in our memories because we're so much bottlenecked by data. So I'm going to cover these two dimensions. And I think we're kind of squeezed in the middle. Uh, technology from this side and our, our applications and systems from this side saying, OK, we should have intelligence in the memory controllers and memories uh, that we have. Let's talk about the technology side. So today, we are having a lot of difficulty with DRAM, for example, or many main memory technologies, as well as some storage technologies like flash memory. But I'm going to pick on DRAM because DRAM is where we actually do a lot of processing of data, except uh, data still moves to the processor, right? Today, we want controllers close to DRAM, and industry is open to new memory architectures, as you can see over here. Uh, I'm going to show you other new architectures that are going to be filled over here, where actually in 2019 and 2021, we're finally moving into processing in memory architectures. So, okay, what is the problem we're having with DRAM? Basically, we're having a lot of technology scaling issues. This is a talk I delivered at the International Memory Workshop in 2013. At that time, we didn't have a lot of evidence, but we argued that technology scaling is going to be, be very difficult, and we're going to have a lot of robustness, reliability, security problems in DRAM. And also, we are, we're already having a lot of data movement problems. We should do something different uh, in our uh, systems. And later, we decided to gather some evidence. We worked with Facebook, for example, in this work where we analyzed all of the memory errors that they have in their servers. And Facebook has a lot of memory at that time. Today, probably, they have a lot more. Uh, and uh, basically, this is one graph that we have in the paper that shows uh, a correlational study uh, in their data centers. And this correlation is uh, the error, uh, it's showing the correlation of the error rate, server failure rate, uh, with the chip density that's employed in the server. So if the chip, chip is denser, this is DRAM chip density, uh, if, the, if the chip is denser, the server rate, uh, failure rate of the server is higher. This is because you get more memory errors. As the chip, is, chip, chip becomes denser, uh, you, uh, the cells are smaller, the cells are closer to each other, so they're much more vulnerable to noise effects and error effects. As a result, uh, you get more errors in the field 
And this is real data uh, from real data centers, production data centers. So clearly we cannot modify what's running, but we can measure. Okay, so if you're interested, there's a lot more data that we have in this paper. Later, well, concurrently, we actually did a lot of uh, infrastructure building, and we built these FPGA-based infrastructures to actually uh, test DRAM chips so that we can understand in a fine-grained manner uh, what kind of issues that we, we, we have uh, in, in terms of the reliability, latency, uh, and robustness behavior of DRAMs. And if you're interested, you can clearly read some of those papers, and this is one infrastructure. We also open sourced this infrastructure recently. Both industry and academia are using it. We're also supporting it. We actually have one more new version of this infrastructure that uh, is not pictured over here. But uh, feel free to use it and we'd, we'd be happy to support it. So while we were doing these studies to together with Intel, we actually found out that you can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips that are manufactured out in the field. Uh, and this is known as the Rohammer problem. Basically, uh, I'm going to give you some more numbers than what's shown over here. But I think this is interesting because this is the first example of how a simple hardware circuit level or device level failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And as a result, people are writing articles that look like this. Forget software, now hackers are exploiting physics. I like this because this really gets to the core of the problem. It's really a physical problem in the end. So let me give you the uh, fundamental robustness issue. Basically, uh, if you look at DRAM, it consists of rows of cells. And if you want to read some cells in one row, you need to activate that row, meaning apply high voltage to the word line, uh, to the row. And if you want to read some other row, you need to apply low voltage back to this word line. This is called pre-charge in DRAM. And if you keep doing this repeatedly, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, enough times before the cells get refreshed, it turns out in many DRAM chips, adjacent, physically adjacent rows get bit flips. There, so there are some vulnerable enough cells that actually flip from zero to one or one to zero uh, because you're really hammering this row. So we call this the hammer row, we call these the victim rows. And we basically show that more than 80% of the modules that we tested from three major DRM manufacturers, there are only three major DRM manufacturers in the world today, let's say unfortunately, uh, I hope it changes going into the future, but uh, basically uh, have these error mechanisms. And this is a scaling problem, this is a technology scaling problem because no chip that we tested that was manufactured before 2010 had these errors. The first appearance is in 2010, and all of the chips that were tested, uh, that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 are vulnerable to this uh, rove hammer error, error mechanism. And why is this happening? Very quickly, this is really because of uh, electromagnetic coupling between the word lines as well as the cells. The cells are too close to each other. Cells are too, too small right now. As a result, uh, when you actually, uh, uh, when you actually uh, do the activation and deactivation, let's say, activation and pre-charge, uh, you, you're actually disturbing uh, the adjacent cells, uh, the adjacent word lines. And, and if you do this enough times, you're disturbing the adjacent cells enough times and you're leaking charge with every hammering, let's say, enough times that uh, if, you, if you're able to do this activation enough times before the cells get refreshed, you would deplete the charge in some of the vulnerable cells. And this is very fundamental, again, this is read disturbance. In a, in a sense, there's nothing new about this, right? Because we knew about read disturbance for decades and decades. It happens in many types of memories. It happens in hard disks. It happens in uh, flash memory. Actually, we did a lot of studies in flash memory before we did studies with uh, DRAM. Uh, now, the difference here is this is architecturally visible, complete to the software. You can do this in software. In all of the other uh, memories, uh, there are protections such that you cannot do this in software. It's very, actually very difficult to do this in flash memory uh, from the software level. Whereas here, uh, because you can induce these bit flips uh, through software, you can actually uh, take over the system. So it's, it's a real robustness uh, problem, both reliability and security. And uh, I think, sorry, it's <laughs> people over here have to look over here, sorry about that. Uh, but basically, when we wrote the paper uh, that introduced the problem, we said memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system, and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. I strongly believe this still. And we, say, we said that basically someone can hijack your system. Uh, with these bit flips. So these bit flips are essentially uh, what, what Lamport would call Byzantine failures, right? You have these Byzantine generals problem and some of them are unreliable. If you have enough unreliable generals, then you will not be able to take over a city. And uh, whenever you have these Byzantine faults, uh, it could be uh, not just a corrupt, uh, corruption issue, it could also be a malicious attack issue. Basically, uh, erroneous can be malicious in the end. Uh, and that's what we argued. And later, people also showed that exactly that, basically. Google Project Zero showed that they could take over a system uh, using these bit flips. Uh, they could basically uh, 
uh, at a, use, a user level program can gain complete, complete kernel privileges by bypassing all, all virtual memory protections that you have in the system. It's beautiful security engineering. I don't have time to cover this in detail. But later, a lot of people actually did a lot of interesting studies where they did interesting attacks. These folks from TU Grass, for example, show that they can gain unrestricted access to website visitors remotely through JavaScript. These folks show that you can act, uh, they can uh, take uh, over your cell phone in a deterministic manner by exploiting the regular memory allocation patterns uh, uh, in the Android operating system. You can still download their app, I think. I don't know if it still works. I don't have an Android, but uh, it used to work. Okay, more recently, uh, these folks actually showed that uh, by inducing Rohammer bit flips, otherwise, an otherwise reasonably accurate neural network can become quite inaccurate. And I think this is quite alarming. I mean, there's, in a sense, there is nothing new. Of course, you should not have bit flips in your memory. But if you're using uh, your memory to actually make critical life critical decisions, for example, in self-driving cars, or a doctor recommending something uh, to you. And if someone attacks your network, or if this happens, uh, I don't know, non-maliciously in some way, your, uh, your otherwise very accurate network uh, can become completely useless. And this could, in my opinion, be very life critical. Because we're gonna depend uh, more and more uh, it, it, uh, on these neural networks in our lives. And if we don't solve these fundamental robustness issues, we're gonna have problems. Okay, so basically memory scaling issues are real and they're asking us to do something more intelligent in memory. I can talk about Rollhammer for this entire hour, I'm not going to, but I think the solution really goes uh, toward building intelligent controllers. So an intelligent controller recognizes that this is happening or this may happen going into the future, so it basically prevents the attack. I'm, going, I'm not gonna tell you exactly how to do it. There are many, many methods that, are, that we have proposed and that others have proposed also to solve the problem. Uh, unfortunately, they're not being implemented yet, and I, I hope they will be implemented. Because the problem is getting worse, so uh, the Rohammer research did not end. Uh, we hope that it would end at some point, but unfortunately, uh, it's getting worse because it's a fundamental scaling problem. For example, uh, our recent study in 2020, ISCA 2020, showed that newer DRAM chips are a lot more vulnerable. You can actually induce these bit flips after only 4,800 hammers. Today, you can do millions of hammers, uh, well, more than a million hammers within a refresh interval. 4,800 is very low. Almost benign applications are able to do that, almost. Uh, and uh, existing mitigation mechanisms are not effective. And uh, what the DI manufacturers did actually, uh, it, it's interesting to see the history also. They actually tried to put some intelligence into their DRAM chips. And uh, what they did was they actually put uh, some Rohammer mitigation mechanisms inside DRAM chips and they claimed our DDR4 chips are completely Rohammer free. And they advertised this. But they didn't tell what they did internally. So basically, they were uh, resorting to security by obscurity, let's say. And uh, we basically, we took on their claim in this work. We basically tried to figure out what they did. And we figured out enough in terms of what they did inside the DRAM chips that we were able to bypass all of those protections. So basically, if you don't put the right type of intelligence that's secure enough into your DRAM chips, you can still induce bit flips. That's what this paper basically showed. You can reverse engineer the underlying mechanisms just enough uh, so that you can actually induce, bypass them and you can induce bit flips. So I think going forward, we need intelligence, but we need also proofs of security in our intelligence. Uh, and I think this is interesting. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about, but so there are solutions certainly. I think this solution, for example, we have a security proof of it. Uh, and I think uh, it, it, it essentially uses bloom filters to detect uh, whether or not a row hammer attack may be going on and basically throttles the process, uh, throttles the memory access of the process that may be inducing a row hammer attack. And clearly this is more intelligence than what we have in memory controllers today. And this did not end actually, we recently published two papers at Micro, which was held last week. Uh, and we basically showed that we can, uh, Rohammer, you really need to understand Rohammer more because there are a lot of interesting sensitivities to temperature, uh, how you actually conduct the attack as well as uh, spatial uh, distribution of the uh, vulnerable bits. So if, if you want to be an attacker, you can actually be a lot more intelligent. Uh, in terms of how you do the attacks. But if you also want to be a defender, you can actually be a lot more intelligent. So I think going forward, we really need intelligence in our system so that we can actually uh, fight the intelligent attackers, let's say, that may be taking advantage of such technology scaling issues. Okay, if you're interested, there are more papers, but I don't have time to talk, and uh, you're certainly welcome to refer, uh, uh, look at the online lectures, except they don't have the research from 2021, for example, this one. Okay, why am I telling you all this? I think it's really interesting because it's all about intelligent infrastructure. We're building inf intelligent infrastructure as computer scientists, computer engineers going into the future, electrical engineers, and we're claiming it's intelligent. We're claiming that it's going to drive our cars. We're claiming that it's going to take us to space. Uh, but maybe we should be more careful. So 
uh, if, if I think about in infrastructure, bridges are great infrastructure, right? Human beings have been building bridges for thousands of thousands of years. And clearly, uh, we have uh, made the art, uh, science and art of bridge engineering uh, something very strong, yet bit flips happen in bridges. This is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Uh, it failed in 1940, for example. And bit flips can be fatal. This is in Seoul, this is in uh, Minneapolis, this is in Genoa. So bit flips keep happening, basically. Uh, and I, I would argue that bridges are not that interesting infrastructure going into the future. The future is really all about computing. We, uh, you, we, will, we will not have billions and billions of bridges. We will have billions of billions of devices that we bet our lives on in some cases. So we should be more careful. And I think uh, we should really think about these robustness issues, security issues. I, this is a very general definition of security that I tell my freshman students, basically. Security is really about preventing unforeseen consequences. And I think we should really shoot that high. Uh, clearly, this is uh, very nebulous, right? What's an unforeseen consequence? Uh, I think if you take this sort of definition, then you start building your system in an intelligent way such that it can try to adapt to any kind of thing that, see, that it sees very quickly. And I think we're not there yet. Uh, and I think we need to be there because if you really want to trust our cars to drive us around, like Mr. Bean does over here, uh, we, we really need to uh, uh, make them secure and safe. So I think this is a challenge going into the future. We want fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe computing architectures or robust. And we need to, somehow they need to be able to predict and prevent such safety and security issues. And I think intelligent memories are part of the uh, equation over here. And I think we're a bit luckier than bridges because it's very hard to patch the bridges right. Uh, these are very heavy infrastructure. Whereas computing, I think we're lucky because uh, we, have, we have much more patchability fundamentally, configurability and reconfigurability. So I think uh, we can do it. But I think we need to really put uh, our goal to be it. If our goal is basically, okay, we're, not gonna, we're gonna ignore these reliability and safety and security problems and somehow things will work, then I think the future is not going to work very well. Okay, but that's of course my prediction. Maybe some, somebody will make it work. Okay, so let, let's talk about the other aspect. So I've been talking about this because I, I want to motivate the importance of uh, putting some intelligence in our systems because of push from technology. Uh, but let's talk about the systems and application side. Uh, arguably, these are even more important. Basically, today, data access is a huge uh, bottleneck. Energy consumption is a key limiter. And data movement energy dominates compute energy. I'm going to give you examples of this. But before I give you the examples, at a high level, do we want a world that looks like this, sustainable, efficient, or do we want a world that looks like this where we cannot even breathe in? or where we cannot even live it. I would argue that we would like certainly sustainability, energy efficiency, and high performance at the same time, because we cannot give up high performance because that has enabled us to solve problems going into the future. But we need to figure out how to get high performance while also being energy efficient and sustainable. And I would argue that today's principles are, go against that. Basically, today, data access is the major performance energy bottleneck. Our current design principles make that bottleneck worse. They basically cause great energy waste. Uh, they also cause great performance loss, but we try to alleviate that performance loss. Basically, processor and uh, memory are far away from each other. When I say memory, please think about data storage in general. It could be, uh, it could be the communication unit also that provides data to the processor, right, today. Uh, but basically, because data access takes a long time today, we actually design our systems to try to tolerate that. What do we do? We make our systems a lot more complex. We add many, many levels of caching hierarchies. They're actually increasing. We had a conversation yesterday with students saying, Okay, uh, we want, uh, uh, people are building hierarchies of 256 megabytes or even more. Is this the right thing to do? Uh, that's the question I asked also. Uh, okay, that's complexity. People are adding a lot more multi-threading. People are adding a lot more prefetching mechanisms. People are adding uh, uh, both at the software and hardware level, by the way, uh, to tolerate the data access. Uh, they're, they're adding very heavy, very heavy out of order execution engines. This is all there, this infrastructure is all there to actually tolerate the data access from memory, mainly. Uh, but when, when, when they work, they actually try to tolerate. I'm going to show you evidence that they don't quite work. Uh, but when they don't work, these actually waste even more energy. So basically, to tolerate the data access, uh, data access is energy inefficient to begin with. To tolerate it, we're actually expending even more energy. So in this vicious cycle, we keep expending more and more energy to actually tolerate the data access, and we're not doing a good job, unfortunately. So if you have a vicious cycle, I think we need to break it, basically. And breaking it requires, in this case, to put intelligence to the other structures that can store and move data. So we need to really change the paradigm and uh, avoid the fact that we can process data only far away from the data. So we need to revisit, I think, the computing system uh, from, it, from the bottom up again. So as I said, today's processors are very processor-centric. I've already said all of this, I think. Uh, yet we also know that the problem is the memory. But we need a change in the system. So this is uh, Dick Seitz. Uh, he, he's the chief architect of alpha processors. 
And after his team designed a flagship alpha processor in the 1990s, he wrote this one-page article. I would recommend everyone to read. It's just one page, one page basically. Uh, he basically titled the article, it's this memory stupid, uh, playing with the uh, election team of the United States at that time. Uh, I think Clinton was running with this, the economy stupid, right? Uh, basically, uh, he said that we designed this machine. It's, it's our flagship machine. It's quite good. It finishes, uh, it's, it's designed to finish four instructions every clock cycle. But on this important workload it's designed for, a database workload, it's finishing one instruction every 4.7 clock cycles. Basically, it's operating at 1 18th or 1 20th of its peak bandwidth. Why? It's waiting for data to come back from memory. And basically, he finishes the article with this sentence. I expect that over the coming decade, memory subsystem design will be the only, only as a synthesis, important design issue for microprocessors. And I agree with that, I think. OK, that's uh, 1996. This is data from my own PhD thesis that essentially shows the same thing. Together with Intel, we analyzed the workloads that they used to design their microprocessors, flagship microprocessors with. And we found out that most of the time, the processor is waiting for data. It's not doing useful work. OK, you don't believe the excites. You don't believe me. Since everybody believes Google, I'll show you data from Google in 2015. This data basically shows essentially the same thing. Uh, Google uh, folks uh, analyzed, according to them, all of their data center workloads. Some of them are quite interesting, and all of us are using these, for example, video search, Gmail, etc. And basically, they showed essentially the same thing. The, uh, the cutting edge processor that they employ in their data centers is waiting for data most of the time. It's doing useful processing only 10 to 20% of its time. This is even despite the fact that the processor is designed to deal with data, right? So, okay, basically, we have a processor-centric design problem, let's say. Uh, we have a grossly imbalanced system as a result of this. This uh, processing is do done in only one place. Everything else moves and stores data. This is energy inefficient, low performance, and complex. And on top of this, to, avoid, to try to avoid this, we make the processor and accelerators even more complex and bloated. And that leads to even more energy inefficiency and performance issues and complexity. As a result, we're back to the pictures that I showed you earlier. Most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data, yet system is still bottlenecked by memory. And hopefully, I've given you enough evidence from the field that shows exactly that. OK, let's look at the energy perspective a little bit more. Uh, this is uh, slides I borrowed from Bill Daly, which uh, you can argue with all the numbers over here. Relative things have not changed, but the numbers, uh, exact numbers, have changed. Basically, uh, 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 an arithmetic operation is very cheap today, 20 picojoules over here. It doesn't matter what kind of arithmetic operation. Pick your favorite. Uh, memory access, 16 nanojoules in this picture. That's 800x difference. Basically, a memory access consumes two to three orders of magnitude the energy of a complex addition today. And there's a lot more data that basically shows essentially the same thing. And as a result, more than 60% of the total system energy is spent on data movement according to our results. I would argue that we do not want to move data. Basically, if the data movement is so costly, does it really make sense to bring two operands from memory to the processor to do a very simple, cheap, energy simple arithmetic operation and write the result back again to memory? That's costing a lot. If you really want to overcome the energy implications of this, you really want to have very high amounts of locality and capture that locality in your caches. And that's actually a lot of amounts of locality. It's very difficult to extract that amount of locality in many, many applications, especially the applications of today. For example, we have graph processing applications that are random access. If you, if you get any locality in those applications, you're lucky. OK, so basically, I think we need a paradigm shift to enable computation with minimal data movement. Compute where it makes sense, enable the ability to compute where it makes sense, where data resides, and make computing architectures more data-centric. So uh, my argument is to actually have it everywhere uh, possible, uh, have the computation capability everywhere possible. But memory is an interesting place, so I'm going to talk about main memory. Although I believe the principles are applicable to other types of, uh, other parts of the system, like storage as well, and people are actually applying some of these principles to the storage as well. Uh, but uh, main memory is interesting because today, if he, main memories are huge. And people actually design applications to fit main memories. There are in-memory databases, in-memory graph processing engines, in-memory media processing, in-memory machine learning engines. They're just fit to design memory so that you don't go into the storage uh, or you avoid storage. So what do, we, what do we want to do? Basically, we would like to be able to query uh, the memory, asking questions to it. Can you execute this function on this huge amounts of data or on this restricted data for me? And the memory says yes, and the memory returns the results. Clearly, it sounds easier than done. Uh, there are many questions over here. How do you design the system, compute-capable memory controllers, processor chip in memory units, software and hardware interfaces? Today, we do not have the interfaces to enable this, at least efficiently. System software, compilers, and languages. Algorithms and theoretical foundations. Uh, I think they all need to be rethought and redesigned, all the way from algorithms to devices. I like the theoretical foundations part over here, because many uh, people over here probably have uh, taken a theory of computing course, and you analyze the complexity of algorithms, right? When you did so, you probably counted the operations, big O, big theta notations. 
I would argue that that's not enough. In a, that's, a, that's, ba that's basically an example of the processor-centric paradigm. Uh, we're counting operations, but maybe the data is a lot more important. Maybe we really need to rethink the theoretical foundations of computing, analysis of algorithms, such that the, it puts data at the center as opposed to processor at the center. Okay, so if you're interested, there's a lot of things that we wrote, for example, in this uh, overview paper. I'm, I'm going to pick and choose some examples over here, uh, uh, but we'll try to keep updating this uh, online as well. Now let me go into two different kinds of processing in memory. So processing in memory has been explored a lot. I think there are two fundamentally different kinds of processing in memory that we should look into. One is processing using memory, the other is processing near memory. Uh, I, I would argue that processing using memory is fundamentally different. Basically you have this memory structure or storage structure. It has some fundamental capability of doing computation. Even though it's designed for storage, it can be slightly changed or slightly rethought to do computation without adding logic or significant logic, I should say. And uh, all memories, in my opinion, are capable of this. I'm going to show you examples from DRAM, but people have actually extended this non-volatile memory, flash, uh, and SRAM. Uh, so we're going to use the analog computational uh, principles, operational principles of memory. Processing near memory is actually simpler, in my opinion. Basically, today, processor is here, memory is here. You get processor closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to memory, inside the memory chip. And at some point, processing may be immersed with memory if you actually have 3D structures, for example, that can mix and match processing and logic. And I think we'll get there. So uh, with this perspective, I think processing near memory is pro probably easier to adopt. And I'll show you examples from the field uh, showing that people are actually adding processing near memory. Samsung, for example, OpMap, they, they already have processing near memory products. Processing using memory is probably longer term, but I think it's probably going to exploit the potential of memory uh, and computation even more going into the future. So let me talk about that. So basically the key idea in processing using memory is to take advantage of the operational principles of memory or storage to perform bulk data movement and computation inside the memory. You can exploit internal connectivity that already exists to move data or initialize data. You can exploit analog computation capability that also fundamentally exists. Uh, and who knows what else. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to start by cheating, let's say. I'm going to talk about data copy and initialization, which is important. Uh, but we don't do it quite well uh, because of our processor-centric thinking, let's say. So uh, clearly data copy initialization is used in many applications and Google in their study recently showed that 5% of the entire, data si uh, uh, entire execution cycles on their data center workloads are spent on these two function calls, memmove and memcopy. That's a lot for just two function calls. So how do we do about data copy today? If you want to copy a small page, four kilobytes, uh, white page to the gray page, Basically, you have to go through all the way to the processor today. You have to do it byte by byte, this high latency clearly, high bandwidth, cache pollution, maybe you could eliminate that through direct memory access, unwanted data moment. Basically, today it takes a long time to do a four kilobytes, so small, I would argue four kilobytes is small uh, data copy. We have the direct memory access engine, not even touching the caches. So wouldn't it be nice actually if you were more data centric? Uh, I think the future hopefully will be, we at least have the option to do this inside the memory without disturbing anything else in the system. And the, uh, th this will be low latency because we're, we're not moving data uh, much, let's say. Uh, this is no, uh, low bandwidth utilization on perhaps the most important system resource, the memory bus. Uh, no cache pollution, but you will make that today also. No unwanted data moment on the memory bus unless you really need it. Basically, I would get, show you a mechanism very quickly that takes us 1,000 nanoseconds to 90 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules to 0 0.04 microjoules. That's between one to two orders of magnitude improvement in terms of performance and energy. And I think the mechanism is very simple. Basically, memory is already able to do this. In fact, when we wrote the paper in 2014, uh, we, we said that to be able to do this reliably, you need to change the memory the way I'm going to describe. But later in 2019, using our soft MC infrastructure, some folks from Princeton showed that you can actually do what we described uh, in real off-the-shelf memory chips if you play with the uh, timings in the memory controller such that you can mimic what I'm going to describe. So you can actually do this in many, many DRAM memory chips. After we read their paper, we actually replicated the results and we showed exactly the same thing. So even though the memory chips are not designed for what I'm going to describe, you can do it in real memory chips today. Uh, not all of them, of course, and not reliably. So if you design the memory chip, you can actually do this much more reliably going into the future. Okay, so basically the key idea is very simple. Uh, if, you, if the two pages uh, share a row buffer, a sense amplifier, you first activate the source page, source row, which brings the data into the sense amplifier, and then you activate the destination row, which brings the data from the sense amplifier to the destination row. And this is based on fundamental chart sharing principles of DRAM operations. Sense amplifiers are very strong. So we use a sense amplifier as a temporary buffer to move the data, uh, copy the data from the source row to the destination row. 
clear there are a lot of other variants that I'm not going to talk about. How do you move the data from bank to bank? How do you move the data from subray to subray? There are papers that we have written that I'm not going to talk about. But the basic idea, the fastest mechanism is two consecutive activate, negligible hardware costs. As I said, existing DRAM chips are capable of doing this. And the results are significant, as you can see, more than an order of magnitude improvement in latency and close to two orders of magnitude improvement in uh, memory energy. And I think uh, more recent works show that this can actually get closer to this red bar over here. Okay. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can, again, uh, read further papers. Clear there's extension and follow-up work. You can do faster inter-subway copy. You can move data at smaller granularities if you want to. You can do better interbank copy, etc. I'm going to flash these papers, and I'm happy to talk about them. But the mindset is, uh, I'd like to talk about the mindset. We're designing a lot of accelerators, and we're very good at designing a lot of accelerators. They're good at specializing computation for whatever they do. Why not actually design some accelerators where we can do good things in the memory side also? Memory is actually good at doing some things. We just need to explore and figure out what the memory is good at doing, like data copy and initialization. I didn't talk about initialization, but initialization is a special case of copy, actually. You just initialize one row and then copy the data to other rows. Uh, but basically, memory is very good at copying and initialization. Why not do it on that side? And this accelerator is a more data-centric accelerator, basically. It's sitting on the right side of the memory bus as opposed to being bottlenecked by the memory bus. And it can be programmed in a similar way to a conventional accelerator. OK, similarly to this, uh, we can support in DRAM computation and or not a majority. I'm going to give you the basic idea. Basically, by activating multiple rows, you can perform computation. And this leads to significant performance improvements. And you can read the paper for more detail. I'm going to give you uh, a little bit more uh, than this. But new memory technologies, I think, enable even more opportunities. On new memory technologies, you can do exactly this, basically, what, I, what I'm going to describe. But you can do even more. Because you don't need to move data much. DRAM reads are fundamentally destructive. New memory technologies are not destructive. As a result, you can minimize the data movement even more. On top of this, because of their three-dimensional structure, you can do matrix vector multiplication uh, in an analog manner. But let's talk about uh, this triple row activation. Imagine that this is one row. I'm, going to, I'm showing you one bit in each row. Imagine that you have, let's say, 8 kilobytes. You can do this on 8 kilobytes. You can do this on thousands of subways. So you can do, do this on, let's say, 10 million or more bits in a DRAM chip concurrently. The idea is, if you activate these rows concurrently, three, ro uh, three rows, what happens is, based on fundamental circuit principles, if at least two of these cells are charged, you get the charge state at the end. If at least two of these cells are discharged, you get the discharge state at the end. And by nature, that's essentially a majority function. It's a bitwise majority. Bitwise majority is a great function, actually. I think Donald Knuth, in his fourth book, talks about bitwise majority as being a great function for computation. And people have actually shown that you can, you can use majority for uh, logic synthesis, for example, at EPFL, uh, Nani de Michele's team. We actually have a recent paper that talks about majority plus not. If you have majority plus not, you're functionally complete. Uh, and you can actually uh, trans translate many algorithms to this majority function and not function. But, uh, okay, uh, one of the reasons why majority function is good is because you can express it uh, as a Boolean function that looks like this. And if you set C to 1, you get the OR of A and B. If you set C to 0, you get the end of A and B. So now you have end and OR in DRAM. What's missing is not. I'm not talk, going to talk about it. You, actually, you can actually have the not because you can see that the complement of the value is on the other side of the sense amplifier. And if you actually somehow feed it back to the array, which is a little bit more cost, you can actually get the complement value of a row that you activate as well. So basically, we can do and, or, not, and majority in DRAM without adding any logic except for the logic that we add for not and triple row activation. So we're not adding logic for computation, if, uh, as you see over here. Uh, the, the operations already exist in the analog capability. Okay, so once you have uh, a functionally complete set of operations, uh, you can translate any algorithm to that functionally complete set of operations, basically. You just need to think differently. You cannot think uh, the way we think about uh, designing algorithms today. Uh, your primitives are basically bitwise majority, bitwise and, bitwise not, and bitwise or. And we actually have a mechanism to translate uh, any operation I will show you later. But why this could be useful? Essentially, there are many algorithms that actually operate on bulk bitwise operations. And uh, for example, databases, uh, web search, et cetera. I'm not going to talk about these in detail. But basically, people actually design databases to maximize the bitwise operations as well, uh, so that they can actually execute on the GPUs. And we actually mapped some of those databases to our simulator that can do these operations. And we found out that you can actually get significant end-to-end -end improvements, 4 to 12x, as you can see over here, in database queries. And we don't even optimize things. If you optimize things, if the technology matures, I think you can do even better going into the future. OK, if you want to learn more about Ambit, we have written papers about it. We have written extensions about it. And this is a framework that actually generalizes uh, 
basically where we actually provide the programming interface, ISA, and hardware support for enabling complex operations. Any operation can be expressed as a function of majority and not. And we actually, for example, show convolutions, uh, how they can be implemented uh, on the substrate. And we can actually implement arbitrary operations and uh, with minimal hardware changes. And there's a framework that does this. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but again, you can read the paper. But the uh, performance improvements that we see are also significant on complex operations as well as real-world applications compared to CPUs, GPUs, high-end. Uh, and again, I think this is just scratching the surface in my opinion because there's a lot more to do. Uh, CPUs and GPUs have been optimized for decades, uh, whereas in-memory compute engines are not optimized as much. In fact, these are the papers that are optimizing it. There are only a handful of papers that are written on the topic, right? Okay, I'm going to skip this one, but basically uh, we, we can ease the adoption by enabling, uh, 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 by, by reducing the burden on the programmer by automating it as much as possible. Okay, so there are a lot of other interesting things that you can do with memory. You can actually generate physical unclonable functions to random numbers inside memory, again, by using the analog operational properties of memory. I'm not, I don't have time to go over this, unfortunately, uh, but these are also very interesting and very important if you want to build a security infrastructure on the memory side. And if you really want to do computation, uh, like general purpose computation on the memory side, but want, you really want to be data centric, you want a security infrastructure on the memory side as well. Okay, uh, so let me quickly talk about processing near memory as well. Chita said that I will take the entire hour, but I'll try to uh, not take as much. Uh, do I have, to, I have time to talk about the processing near memory aspect? Yeah. Okay, I'll talk about processing near memory because it's already happening, basically. Uh, uh, when, when I used to talk about this, I didn't have evidence that this was happening, uh, or at least I couldn't talk about it. But in 2019, we had the first chips from UpMem, uh, and now we, uh, Samsung is already uh, doing this. So basically, uh, processing near memory is putting uh, processing structures near and near memory. You can start with uh, memory controllers, you can start with the DRAM chip, and at some point you can start with 3D stacked architectures, for example. Uh, uh, monolithic 3D stack architectures are quite interesting. But here, I think the potential is, how do you actually take advantage of this for uh, interesting applications like graph processing. When we first started looking into this, we wanted to look at graph processing. Graph, graphs are very important in many, many domains. Bioinformatics is one of them, actually. And scalable large-scale graph processing is challenging because it exercises the data bottleneck heavily because it has frequent random memory accesses and little computation to cover for it. And uh, we basically wanted to look at processing near memory and uh, 3D stack architectures that look like this, memory layers on top of a logic layer and the logic layer is connected with low latency, high bandwidth connections to memory layers, is a good place to put computation. And this is the system we designed. It's, it's essentially a distributed system programmed using remote function calls. And what you do is uh, you map your graph on top of this distributed system. Each node in the distributed system is a cube that looks like this. And each cube looks like this internally. Inside the cube, inside the logic layer, there's a distributed system also. It's a distributed system, of course. These are in-order cores so that you can actually handle the ter thermal limitations of this. But these in-order cores can communicate with each other. They can send functions. Uh, and each in-order core has access to memory that's on top of it, essentially the stack on top of it. And we don't move data here. If you want to update a graph node, for example, you need to send a message to the core that houses the graph node uh, on, on, the, on the memory layers. So it's, uh, it's programmed using remote function calls. Uh, and you need graph partitioning also, et cetera, uh, to make this work nicely. And we have some prefetching mechanisms to take advantage of the ample bandwidth that's available to the course. I'm glossing over a lot of detail. This is a full system design that actually shows that you can make this work, in my opinion. And clearly, there are a lot of actually design choices that other people have improved after we publish the paper. I'm going to mention that briefly. But basically, the systems that we had at the time are all bottlenecked by memory. You can see the memory bandwidth that's available to the systems that we compared to. Tesseract system looks nothing like them. Because processing and memory are, let's say, uh, immersed with each other. Processing and memory uh, are not separate from each other like existing systems. As a result, you can enable very high bandwidth access to memory. And if you actually map five graph processing algorithms manually on top of this, you can get significant performance improvements. It's more than 13x. And this is our mapping. Later work, actually, there, there are a lot of later works that built on this work that uh, these are completely independent of us. And these folks show that by optimizing the system better, like doing better load balancing, better data mapping, uh, better communication across the course, you can actually get this to uh, close to two orders of magnitude improvement on graph processing applications. And energy benefits will be commensurate also. We showed 8x energy reduction, but later works showed how to improve that to close to two orders of magnitude. So I think this is fascinating. If you actually optimize a system, uh, you can get two orders of magnitude improvements using an infrastructure that looks like this. 
And if you want to learn more about our work, this is the work, uh, but later works actually uh, are interest, quite interesting as well. Okay, so that may be far-fetched ways because someone will actually uh, design uh, a system completely for graph processing. There will be some people to do it. I think of this as a primitive GPU. GPUs were quite primitive, let's say 20 years ago, right? But people actually said, okay, I can take advantage of this computational unit. So I'm gonna use, uh, take my application and map it to the GPU. And they actually showed a lot of gains. And over time, many, many more people showed a lot of gains. And I think if things evolve that way in processing in memory, we're gonna see even higher gains than what we, said, what we, uh, what we uh, saw with GPUs. Okay, but maybe not everyone's ready for that. Uh, we also did some studies with Google, as I mentioned, uh, where we actually tried to just ship function calls to memory, as opposed to redesign the entire system to, uh, uh, for, for a particular application using processing in memory. And I'm gonna go through this quickly, but these are the applications that we examined, and I already mentioned this result. But basically, we found out that most of the data movement comes from simple functions. And if you actually somehow identify those simple functions, you can execute them on small embedded low power cores, ship them to memory, or uh, build small fixed function accelerators on the memory side. In my opinion, reconfigurable units are actually very interesting also. I think heterogeneous computing on the memory side is actually quite interesting because uh, none of these fit uh, very well uh, to everything that we want to offload to memory. And we basically showed that if you actually identify the functions nicely, on average, you can get more than 2x performance energy improvements in these important workloads. And I think 2x is, okay, maybe it doesn't sound as exciting as 13x or 100x, but the effort that you put over here is much lower than the effort that we put in the previous one. And these are the workloads, just to give you an idea, clearly everybody's excited about machine learning today and we examined TensorFlow, uh, we've examined some uh, interesting inference uh, workloads over there and we found out that data moment is a problem in TensorFlow and uh, a lot of the data moment comes from very simple functions like packing, unpacking and quantization that are getting the data ready for processing between processing different, uh, across different layers. And if you offload them, you get significant performance improvements. Okay, so this is another example that is more adaptable, let's say. Okay, I'm gonna go through this quickly, but I think you, uh, there's a lot of evidence to, uh, that shows that you can do this in GPUs. Some of these works are with Cheetah, actually. Linked data structures, dependent cache misses, accelerating prefetching. Uh, more recently, we've been uh, toying with FPGAs with high bandwidth memory, which are essentially near memory compute engines. And we show that uh, significant performance improvements on weather prediction workloads are actually possible. On, these are real systems uh, with FPGAs with high bandwidth memory. And as I said, genome analysis is interesting. We've been accelerating time series analysis with accelerators. And more recently, we've also been looking at, uh, together with Google again, we've been analyzing the neural network models that they employ in their edge devices. And we find out that more data-centric accelerators can improve performance as well as energy efficiency significantly. I don't have time to talk about this, but this is a recent PAC paper uh, that we published where we showed that uh, by having heterogeneous accelerators, two of them are data-centric, one of them is compute-centric, and mapping the layers, different layers of different types of neural networks, we examined CNNs, LSTMs, transducers, RCNNs, uh, having a scheduling mechanism that maps these layers to the appropriate accelerator, you can gain significant performance energy improvements. You can see the numbers over there, 3x to 3.1x. And I think this is significant because existing machine learning accelerators, a lot of them are compute-centric. Uh, you have to move the data to, uh, to, to the accelerator. Basically, we're questioning that over here. Compute-centric accelerators have their place, especially when you have very, very heavy convolutional computations. But data-centric accelerators are also important, and you need to augment the system with that sort of data-centric accelerators. I think there's a lot more uh, to do in this area, clearly. Okay, I'm excited about FPGA-based near-memory acceleration also. And if you're interested in this topic, we have recently written an overview paper on this also, based on our experiences with uh, genome analysis as well as weather prediction. Okay, so I think I've given you some examples that motivate that there could be something here uh, in re-examining processing in memory, but I think we need to revisit the entire stack and I think everything that I said uh, requires some sort of algorithm uh, to device co-design. Even row clone, uh, where we actually use the memory to do the copying, you still need to express those copies from the algorithm level, right, somehow. Okay, but I think uh, we also need to get there step by step. So we're actually looking at simple mechanisms to enable this and you can find out more information about this in these papers. Uh, okay, so let me, let me jump into what's happening right now. So these, this is actually real. This is a real system that was designed by the UpMem startup in Grenoble, France. Uh, we've been working with them for a couple of years now. We have some papers that I'm going to mention. But basically what they did was they put a processing unit inside uh, the DRAM chip. These are real modules. This is a 2560 DPU system that we experiment with. But you can see from this picture that this is a DRAM bank and you have a processor over here, simple pipeline processor. This is the example of processor getting closer and closer to memory, right? Uh, and you can actually program it. They have a software development kit. And we actually have released benchmarks, uh, analyze its performance. 
It actually performs quite well if, the, if you can make the workload fit this paradigm nicely. Uh, it can outperform the CPUs and GPUs significantly, and you can find some of the workloads that we released and uh, we're happy to uh, work with anyone who is interested in this. It's all open source, basically. And we have a lot of uh, educational material that talks about uh, this uh, uh, real architecture and how to take advantage of it. And we're working with them to actually uh, uh, enable the next generation, let's say, uh, of uh, devices that are much better, hopefully, uh, in terms of workload execution. I'm going to skip uh, some of these, but we also have a lot of methodology. Uh, mecha I think methodology is really important. Like, you, uh, okay, processing in memory has been shown to be very good uh, for different kinds of workloads. So you can see actually expand this. But the question still remains, uh, from, from a programmer's perspective, you have your program. What should you offload to the memory side? Right? And we need mechanisms to enable that uh, in an easy way to the programmer. And this is one of our attempts to do this. We analyzed more than 300 applications from many domains, more than 77,000 functions. And we basically uh, have a methodology to classify the bottlenecks uh, in these applications. You can see some of them are DRM with DRM latency, cache capacity, et cetera. And based on this, programmer can be guided to do, let's say, the right offloading to uh, different types of accelerators. And the paper talks about more details that I don't have time, but it's also all open source. You can find it online, and we're happy to get feedback on it. OK, well, I think one last real thing uh, over here. Samsung finally, uh, more recently, uh, announced that they're also building a processing in memory engine. They actually showed that in ISSCC <laughs> in 2021. Uh, they also showed it in uh, ISCA. Uh, they have a longer paper in ISCA as well. They basically said that uh, they, they want to accelerate machine learning, of course, uh, with uh, uh, multiply and accumulate instructions processed near the bank. And their design is actually quite similar to OpMem architecture. So it's a processing near memory engine, except this is much more specialized. You can see the instruction set over here, much more specialized for multiply and accumulate whereas UpMem's architecture is much more general purpose. You can actually execute anything over there. Uh, well, anything I should say, uh, UpMem didn't design the multiplies to be very efficient, uh, but I think they're gonna change that going into the future. But these are real chips, and I think uh, this is quite interesting that's happening. Samsung also has other module level processing near memory mechanisms that they also announced recently. So I think the good news is industry is finally picking up on it. Uh, compared to 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2020s, 2010s, finally the industry is also seeing that we're kind of being squeezed in the middle. Uh, and I think there's more to come, hopefully. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip these, but there's a lot more that we have uh, online. I think uh, if you want to build fundamentally energy efficient architectures, uh, we cannot avoid being data centric. If you also want to be fundamentally high performance, we cannot avoid being data centric. So I think feature is really data centric to go. And the, the reason is we would like to minimize data movement. And if you don't, uh, if you're not data centric, we're not going to minimize data movement. Adoption issues, like with any paradigm, there are adoption issues. And I think with processing in memories, there's a lot of adoption issues, as you can see over here. There's a diverse set of adoption issues, which I'm not going to cover. Our papers actually cover a lot of these issues. We worked on different types of these issues also. I'm not claiming that we solved all these issues. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot of research to be done to enable adoption, but I believe all can be solved with a change of mindset. And the mindset should really be data-centric as opposed to processor-centric. Like, you can, you can always argue uh, uh, why this should not happen, right? It's easy to say, okay, existing data is not mapped like that. Why? Because data mapping in, today, in today's system is done from a processor-centric perspective. You execute the application in the processor, and the data is mapped across the memory controllers, across the banks, across the channels, from the processor's perspective to maximize the bandwidth. Clearly that data mapping has to change if you want to be data centric. And this is just one example, right? That's, that's, that's what I mean by changing the mindset. If you say, okay, it won't work because we do it this way, that's not gonna work. You need to change how you do it to actually make the future happen. Okay, so uh, I think PIM can enable me new medical platforms as well that I'm quite excited about, as I mentioned over here. So unfortunately, uh, as I predicted, we don't have time for the next two parts, which are data-driven, self-optimizing computing architectures, and also data where expressive computing architectures. Uh, but uh, maybe we can talk about that uh, separately some other time. Okay, let me conclude, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. But I have slides over here, so these slides are, uh, will be available on my website, uh, if nowhere else. So let me quickly conclude. I think, uh, I believe that's time uh, to design principled system architectures to solve the data handling problem. And we have a huge data handling problem that manifests itself as a memory storage and communication problem today. We would like to be designed complete systems to be truly balanced, high performance, energy efficient. This will hopefully lead us to truly intelligent systems. And I think we need to be data centric, data driven, and data aware for this. Uh, I think to, do, to be able to do this, we need to enable computation capability inside and close to memory. This can, hopefully, as I showed you, lead to orders of magnitude improvements, even with uh, the 
not so, uh, let's say, optimized system that we have today. Uh, hopefully, this can enable new application and computing platforms. And hopefully, it can enable a better understanding of nature. So if you think about nature, I think maybe when we design our systems, we're violating nature. So if you look at, for example, how nature uh, behaves, like brains, uh, it's, it, it probably is not processor-centric based on all the evidence we have. And who knows what else, right? And that's the picture of a brain. We don't, I don't claim to understand all of the principles here, but I can, I can, I can certainly say that uh, the design principle doesn't seem to be just processor-centric over here. It seems to be a lot more data-oriented. It seems to be a lot more processing immersed with memory. And it seems, it seems to be a lot more specialized for different types of data as well. I'm not claiming that should be the goal, but that should probably be part of the goal because that's, uh, that has a lot of efficiency in some uh, cases. But I think to get there, we need to revisit the entire stack. And over time, we need to exploit and discover good principles. For uh, more than anything else, I think we need open minds. And I think the future is really uh, uh, on bright students to find out those uh, principles. OK, uh, with that, I think I will conclude. But I will also uh, acknowledge people who funded this research. Please keep funding us. And I also acknowledge, more, uh, more importantly, uh, my research group has enabled all of this research. And you can see some pictures. You can also read about their research that I didn't get a chance to discuss in our newsletters. You can find all the papers, talks, and artifacts online. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Actually, the, the, the key point that you're talking about resonates with me because you, you want to do it. You're data centric and near data computing, right? So I'd like to hear, you, you know, since you are very visionary, I'd like to hear your thought and the, and the comment about this, um, um, you know, near data computing. You're talking about processing in memory, right? but data are mostly stored in data storage. Can we do like Processing in memory and uh, in storage mm -hmm. because you're talking, you know, when you transfer data from storage to computer, mm -hmm. it goes through PCIe, it mm -hmm. goes through, you know, that you know, in terms of timing and energy, you consume more than memory bus. Mm -hmm. First, yeah. go one step further. I mean, all data okay, are generated by sensors. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> you know, like a human eyes, right? We see things, but before yeah. we send information to brain, you to process. Process, yeah. we already process image. Mm -hmm. You know, the taste bar in the mouth. When we drink wine, mm -hmm. right, we taste the uh, wine differently before we send information to brain. Sure. <laughs> so can we do like in sensor computing? Yeah. So <laughs> further, right? Yeah. So 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 how, what do you think about this uh, you know data centric computing mm -hmm. uh, in data storage and in sensors? Sure. A absolutely. Basically uh, that, that, that's why I mentioned processing data where it makes sense as opposed to just in-memory. In-memory is just one example. And uh, sometimes, actually, when I give this talk, I talk about in-sensory computing. It's just an example of data-centric computing. And I think uh, we have to do that also. We have to do, uh, I think memory is interesting because uh, existing applications are designed for it. And also, the latencies are different in memory. Uh, storage, I think, is certainly an important place where we should also uh, do uh, processing. In fact, we have some works uh, that are doing uh, genomic processing on the storage side right now. But sensors are certainly a, an important place also, because that's where the data is generated. And if you really want to truly minimize the data movement, you should really uh, do the processing where data is generated. If you can do it, of course, right? Sometimes you may not be able to do it because you don't know what you're going to do with the data. You just want to need to capture the data and then process afterwards. But if you can do it, I think in-sensor computing is, a, is also an important place. And I think the fundamental principles, not exactly the techniques, but the principles of uh, operating can be applied there. And I think we need to discover what those are in terms of the different sensor devices uh, and how to make it happen. Great, thank you. Sure. You're welcome. So, may I ask you a question? Do no. you? Do <laughs> you? I have a lot of questions, but we don't have time. Yeah, I know, but can I ask you a question? You ask my question. I'm not going to speak. All your questions start with why in the. Yeah, because I'm not going to speak. Why?
one of the thoughts, one of the things that you kind of working on, is there a way in which you can sort of combine these two things together? You know, you, you don't really have some sort of structured thing for some of the computation, but some from other types of computations, you you can have sort of a brain-inspired mm -hmm. model. Uh, and in fact, if there's a way you can sort of combine them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, of course, I don't have the answer to exactly, but I think uh, that seems like a right direction to explore, a good direction to explore, for sure. I, I agree with you. A lot of the uh, uh, computation and communication and memory that doesn't seem to be as structured uh, in memory, partly because we don't quite understand it, and partly because it's more uh, perhaps fungible, right? Uh, that, that's what I was kind of also getting at when, we, uh, when I was talking about the security, right? You, have, you want to prevent unforeseen consequences, and perhaps if you're more fungible, meaning you can change uh, the structure or uh, you're, you're fundamentally less structured to begin with, you're more flexible to begin with, you can actually uh, be more robust uh, to issues like bit flips you may get in the computation. So I think uh, we may not have really discovered that uh, non-structured way of doing computation. I and mean, certainly there's work that's happening in like neuro spiking neural networks and that area, neuromorphic computation, let's say truly neuromorphic computation. Uh, uh, and I think uh, we really need to do more work uh, research in that area to understand that and how it interacts with the more structured computation as well. And I think if we, if we somehow understand the brain more, that will give us uh, perhaps better inspiration, let's say, uh, to, to understand it. That's why I think there, uh, it's, it's, it's very good to have efforts that try to couple uh, neuromorphic com computing with the understanding of neuroscience uh, in a better way. And, and the other thing is that, that this notion of memory, you know, sort of a point memory versus a sequence memory, you know, mm -hmm. there's a, you know, data often has, is not just a single point mm -hmm. data, but there's correlations in the data, so yes. there's always a sequence in that. So memorizing sequences as part of a computational model is probably is very important for next generation of machine learning models. Yeah, yeah absolutely, I agree with that. Okay. I think there needs to be uh, certainly much more interaction uh, with, let's say, neuroscientists and neuropsychologists and uh, also computer designers, which has been missing for a while. In fact, I think it's interesting to think, uh, like when I was studying psychology in my undergraduate, uh, psychology was fascinated with computing. Computing was a paradigm uh, for understanding humans. And I think uh, quickly that fascination uh, like went away uh, because computing has nothing to do with the way brain works. But I think maybe uh, the other way should uh, uh, become more popular going into the future. We should be more fascinated with how uh, computing is done in, let's say, uh, living structures like our brain uh, so that we can understand what those principles could be and get the right principles to make our computers fundamentally better. Thank you. Uh, running short of time, one last question. Okay. Can you, can you please remove uh, masks? Because oh, sure. It's hard to hear. Yeah, yeah. My name is Colin, and I'm from Mobile. I'm really impressed by the example of the memory move and the memory copy. But that example, you showed that the, you can do the row-to-row -row copy in the DRAM. Right? Mm -hmm. I know that the system complexity is actually a lot of times they consider about the compatibility. Right? Mm -hmm. For example, you, the, uh, because uh, they involve, may, may involve the virtual memory, Mm -hmm. right. So virtual memory, so you have to uh, take the data back to the CPU and then mm -hmm. go through the cache to make sure that all of the I.O. stack, the data are consistency. Mm -hmm. So I would say the, uh, the compatibility will be a very a really big challenge to realize this kind of new ideas in the mm -hmm. real system. For mm -hmm. example, if you want to achieve the uh, road to road copy of the data in the DRAM, it may, may require the change of the CPU. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, I think. And in the paper, we cover some of those issues, actually. And in later papers, we also cover some of those issues. But yeah, to make even a simple idea like this work, uh, you really need to uh, like revisit the entire stack. Uh, even though it sounds like a very simple idea, uh, unless you're in very specialized cases where you exactly know what's going on in the system, if you're in a general purpose operation mode, especially, you really need to change the CPU and you need to revisit potential cache coherence mechanisms. Uh, and we actually have been working on cache coherence mechanisms also uh, to make sure that whenever you're copying the data over here, you don't get the wrong answers uh, because of cache data over here. Uh, 